right before we were going to launch just the one skew, no, yeah. just lemon, right? Lemon Perfect was going to launch. And then what happened was the bottles came off the line. And when I looked at the packaging for the first time, I said, my God, this is not going to work. Hello, and welcome to Starting Small. My name is Cameron Nagel, and what you're about to hear is a resilient story to an entrepreneur's journey over the brand that we know and consume today. At Starting Small, I believe that everyone has a story to tell under one philosophy. Everyone starts small. Even these founders have once started where you are, in their parents' kitchen, basement, out of a wagon, and many more. At Starting Small, we discuss the strategies used, the obstacles overcome, and the successes of an entrepreneur's journey. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Starting Small, and make sure to leave a review to let us know how you enjoyed it. Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Starting Small. Today, I'm joined by Yanni Huffnagel of Lemon Perfect. Yanni, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Cameron. Of course. So I'd like to start out with your upbringing. Uh, where did you grow up, and what would you say your childhood was like? I grew up in Scarsdale, New York, Westchester County, and uh, um, my, uh, my, my, my childhood, I guess I would say, was a really good one. Um, uh, a lot of dear friends that have, have powered Lemon Perfect um, yeah, to this day and uh, uh, really uh, close relationship with my two younger brothers and uh, a mom and dad that, that have uh, continued to uh, provide in, the, in a big way for me and, and, and place bets along the way. Amazing. Would you say that you had an entrepreneurial mindset, uh, say lemonade stands, early day of lemonade or selling products, anything like that? You know what? You know what? I, so I, I'll answer that question in, in a little bit of a different way. So I, 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 I uh, started gambling pretty early in high school, to be honest. And so it, actually, if you look at if you look at the, the research on on entrepreneurs, you're going to find a through line to early gambling uh, in high school. Uh, and, and I'm no different. I I um, I was. Uh, my junior and senior year of high school, I'd carry around a, uh, uh, a portable blackjack setup. And uh, instead of drinking beer on Friday and Saturday night, I'd pull out the blackjack table. So, uh, yeah, and I, I, we carried that through to college. So the answer is, I think I've had a entrepreneurial mindset in some ways from the beginning. I, you know, I went to high school kind of in the, in the early days of, of the dot-com uh, 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 you know, kind of gold mining, if you will. And so I bought some domain names early on and, and sold all of them too early. But uh, um, yeah, I think I've always been uh, a hustler at heart. Definitely. So I saw you went on to study at uh, Cornell. What did you end up studying there? And why did you choose this institution? Uh, I was in the School of Industrial and Labor Relations because I felt like that was the one school that was going to take me or gave me the best chance to get in, to be honest. I think that was that's <laughs> probably the truth. Um, you know, uh, it was also it was also the the only school within Cornell or the only college within Cornell uh, that had an interview process. And my grades were average, but I thought I could get them with a good interview. And sure yeah. enough, I think the interview was what propelled me to get in. <laughs> Amazing. I saw in your early days of your resume that you had a, a lot of experience in professional or college uh, basketball coaching. Did you have any athletic time at Cornell or what did that look like for you as well? Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I played lacrosse in, in high school, um, which ultimately led me to Penn State. So I started my career at Penn State, uh, played lacrosse there for a year. And then when I transferred to Cornell, um, I was in the weight room and I came, uh, I walked into or met one of the assistant basketball coaches. Um, and, uh, we got to talking and he said, my God, uh, your love of basketball is fantastic. And, you know, we're looking for managers. Would you be interested in, in joining us? Uh, and it was at the very, you know, kind of nascent stages of Cornell's rise in the Ivy league, early 2000, Steve Donnie had just taken the job there. And uh, a few weeks later, I was uh, I traded in my lacrosse stick for mop and sweat off the floor, and and that you know that pivot was one of seemingly many pivots along the way, but probably the most important one, right? Because yes. it exposed me to a world uh, of basketball and eventually you know the NBA and college basketball that has has really fueled the journey of 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 my life. Definitely. 
I, I saw that one of your early experiences was actually coaching at Harvard. And in this time frame, you were getting your master's degree too. Uh, what did this period of your life look like when you're pursuing your master's, you're going into collegiate coaching as well? What did that period look like for you managing your time? Well, there wasn't a lot of it. Um, we had, so this was before the, the Harvard gym uh, was, was redone. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, there was a little locker room. It might have been 100 square feet. And it was for the officials, for them to change in uh, uh, before, you know, during, before games, before and after games. And um, I actually bought a little twin mattress that I put in in this like hundred square foot smelly old locker room. And I lived at the office for like a year. Um, that's, that's the, that's the truth, right? Uh, Cameron, that was one of the first like investments of just my time that I made, uh, at the expense of, of, you know, um, social activities and and so forth. Right. But I was just at that, you know, I, I wanted to, so I left Oklahoma before I finished my master's. I really wanted to, to get it done. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, that was an incredible struggle to take online classes that were intense. And at the same time, you know, go coach college basketball, right, as a full-time assistant. So, yeah, I mean, uh, I had an apartment, but I didn't go home much. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I remember buying a little twin mattress and a, uh, uh, a pillow that I never even put a pillowcase on, a little blanket from Target, and that's what I had for a year. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. So, where where were you housing that pillow and blanket, and how was that allowed? That was was that at Harvard as well? Yeah. Well, what happened was is I I I kept it under wraps for a while, and the only person that knew was Nick the janitor. Um, <laughs> uh, that's the truth, man. The only person that knew was Nick the janitor. And then they, they actually caught on and they were like, Yanni, you got to go home at night. So I actually moved my stuff up to like this perch where they would broadcast the games. Uh, so I actually, I, I did, I had to pivot, but, but uh, you know, look, I, I, I think um, when you want something, you just got to figure out how to go get it. And, Definitely. you know, Coach Amaker took an incredible chance on me, um, having no experience besides my two years at Oklahoma as a graduate assistant. And I just wanted to work for him. I wanted to work for other assistants. I wanted to work for Harvard and for the program. And um, it ended up, you know, paying off. But th- listen, in, in any journey, there's going to be sacrifice, right? And, yeah. and, and for me, it was those first couple of years at Harvard and then the first couple of years of Lemon Perfect. Definitely. So getting into Lemon Perfect in 2017, you're coming off this resume of collegiate basketball. And I'm sure hydration has a strong part of that uh, inspiration. What inspired you to get into better for you, lemon water and create lemon perfect then? Insanity. I think, um, <laughs> you know, uh, my last year I was coaching at the university of Nevada in Reno and, um, a friend of mine wrote a book on the ketogenic diet. Um, and, and in the back of, of Matt's book, were all these, these sample meal plants, right? And every day started by drinking organic lemon water. And I was searching a little bit, you know, for some structure around my diet, some structure around my, my workout plan. And uh, I said, Matt, I'm in A through Z, let's do this. And, and so what happened with lemon water in the morning, organic lemon water in the morning, uh, became a non-negotiable part of of my daily routine, right? In the back of, of Matt's book were all these sample meal plans and every day started by, by drinking organic lemon water. Yeah. Um, and you know, Cameron, I, I hated it, right? Buy an organic lemon, cut the lemon, squeeze the lemon juice all over bland paste. I mean, most mornings I just threw my hands up in the air and I said, Shh, like, there's gotta be a better way here, but I stuck with it and I felt great. Um, and Fast forward towards the end of the season, I'm in the video room, which was next to our locker room. And I look around and all of our, all of our coaches and players are drinking by. Um, and this is, this is the first quarter of 2017. So this is really at the, at the, um, the pinnacle of buys growth story. Mm-hmm. And uh, I said, hold on, can we take organic lemon water and give it the flavor profile of buy? And Cameron, that seed, you know, this idea of 
great flavor that's also good for you has been the bedrock of Lemon Perfect from day one. And it's not like I sprinted out of the locker room, you know, with games to play and said, I'm going to go start a beverage brand. I, not yeah. at all. Um, you know, the season ended, we, we lost to Iowa State in the first round of the NCAA tournament. And, and I was maybe a week after I was in Los Angeles having lunch with a friend. And I was just, uh, John, what do you think of this idea? And he's very entrepreneurial. And he said, I love it. Anything that you can build that can capture a piece of someone's daily routine, what they do in the morning when they first get up, what they do at night when they go to sleep, or any point B, C, D, E in between is worth going for. And I said, my God, I jumped up. And all I knew, right, was organic lemon water in the morning. I mean, I just thought of it. I said, John, we're going to go, we're going to go win the morning. This is everyone is going to start their day with this. Yeah. And that night I Googled how to start a beverage company. I mean, that, wow. is, the, that is the heat. That's the story. And from that night on John's couch on, um, you know, uh, I, I have just put one foot in front of the other and believed in what we can build. That's amazing. So without any prior experience, especially direct to consumer and all this coaching experience prior, what were those first steps in producing your first product? Say the R and D process, what did that prototyping process look like? You're already making lemon water yourself, but what did that look like to commercialize it then? It's a, it's a great question. A lot of pain and suffering. I can tell you that a lot of dark moments. Um, you know, Google was my friend, and so was just tuning the world out, sitting down in front of a computer and figuring this thing out. I mean, I moved back in with my mom and dad. So that's a really yeah. sobering moment, right? Because I, I didn't save a lot of money coaching college basketball. So I, I moved back in with like $50,000 in my bank account. Um, and I said, I'm going to put all of this money towards R and D and, and figuring this thing out, packaging design, right? The IP, the early IP protection, yep. incorporating the cover. Right? And so I, there wasn't a lot of money left over for rent. Uh, so I moved back to New York from Reno with my mom and dad, right? And at 36 years old, that's a tough moment, <laughs> but I just believed in this, right? I believed in it enough after I tried the product for the first time. Uh, yeah, I, I got connected with a, a, a beverage development lab through Google. Um, and, um, you know, once I tried the product for the first time, the original samples it was August 28, 2017. I knew there was magic inside the bottle like that. Mm. I knew, and I've always said from day one, like it has to taste good. Yeah. Nothing else matters. If what's inside the vessel doesn't allow people to keep coming back. And so, so um, that's how it started. And then, uh, you know, Cameron, it was like, okay, well, we got the product. Then what do we do? Well, then I had to figure out, well, what does the bottle look like, right? So, you know, we, 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 we took a few passes at that. And, um, you know, then I was out of the $50,000. I said, oh, no, this is not good. You know, it's either like start putting money on American Express or, yeah. or raise some money. And so I went to one of my friends in VC and I said, uh, uh, you know, what do, what do we do here? He said, are you a LLC or a Delaware C? I said, a what or a what? Um, <laughs> you know, I, I had the truth, yeah. right? And then he said, I said, I don't know. And, 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 and uh, he said, well, you should it'd probably be a little bit easier to raise capital as a, as a C Corp. And so I said, okay, that, that's how, you know, but I said, let me just double. So I actually Googled another startup attorney, San Francisco, because I figured, you know what, there's going to be someone out there that knows what they're doing. Yeah. And so that led me to our, we still have, you know, our commercial transactions are still done by that same firm and, wow. and they've been great. And, and then, you know, uh, they, they said, well, we're going to raise, you know, your first instrument will be a, a, a convertible note. I said a, a convertible what, you know, and, and so, <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, Cameron, we, we, we ended up raising right away just on the strength of the taste of the product alone. And I think, I guess, my ability to storytell and a story of Big Tam, uh, we raised over a million dollars. We raised $1.2 wow. million. Um, and it was, you know, the smallest check was $5,000. We had four $100,000 checks, which for me at the time, I was like, you know, I was like, my God. And, um, <laughs> you know, it, it's just, it's fun for me to see now on that original, you know, for that original group almost a seven X markup, you know, call it wow. three years later. Incredible. So I'm curious at launch then, uh, you guys have numerous SKUs and uh, flavors today. What were those first vital flavors? Was it that one first lemon flavor that you launched with? 
Yeah, great question. Um, so I was fortunate enough that early on, uh, I met um, a, a couple of, they soon became advisors for us, uh, in essence, a, a beverage incubator um, mm -hmm. in Southern California, uh, uh, Dan Moore and Robert Alshuler. And I walked in with just the one product. I mean, Lemon Perfect was what our Just Lemon is today. There was no multiple stew environment, right? Yeah. And, and um, you know, so what happened was, was you know, I, I was told you can't just launch with just one flavor, one skew, it'll get lost on the shelf. You yeah. have to build a, a presence. If you're going to present, you know, Lemon Perfect to a retailer, you should present three or four skews. Yep. So I didn't even know what a skew was, to be honest, right? Like, like uh, uh, we, we, we have... Uh, we have a very prominent investor um, uh, and uh, who's in the beverage world. And he actually early on said, you know, are you going to build a multiple spoon environment? I said a multiple what? You know, like it just it's, it, it is very funny when you think about this now. Yeah. And but we 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 um, we ended up going back. I went to the original lab and and um, I said, you know, can can we just try to innovate on flavor? Like what happens if you add organic flavors to the base product? And Cameron, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was, it was April 8th, 2018. And I was in LA, so I moved, you know, I, I knew enough to know that like, you know, Los Angeles is ground zero for brands to go incubate, especially the natural channel. Yeah. And, um, you know, uh, we, a couple things happened. So right before we were going to launch just the one, just the one skew, no, yeah. just lemon, right? Lemon perfect was going to launch. And then what happened was the bottles came off the line. And when I looked at the packaging for the first time, I said, my God, this is not going to work. And it was a great learning for me. It's what something looks like on a computer screen or on a piece of paper is so different than what it's going to look like on the shelf. Definitely. And so what ended up happening was I called 40 investors and I said, hold on a second. We're not going to launch the product. I have to get our packaging right. And if you go back and you look at the original packaging, it looked like a medicine bottle. <laughs> um, and uh, we ended up spending seven months redesigning the brand. And in that time is when Dan said, we should expand our skew portfolio, our flavors. And so I went back to the original flavor lab. And uh, when I tried some of his samples for the first time, I was, in a, I was still in our WeWork in Manhattan Beach. And it was one of those moments, Cameron, uh, it was the moment where I actually really thought that we could build a billion dollar bit because I said, my, so, it was the product was so good. Oh, we had the he, he, Marty dropped off like 10 flavors. Yeah. I remember it was a hot day. I remember taking off my shirt and running around the WeWork like this. It was a <laughs> Sunday. And you I was yelling and screaming. Pump it, like, come on, let's get like it was one of those moments. Yeah. And uh man, that changed it for us, right? That was a a, a big moment. And you know, fast forward, we we were in a cold chain environment. We ended up pivoting to a shelf stable environment because, um, you know, I realized early on that uh, uh, cold chain delivery doesn't exist really at the big strategics. And yeah. then to go build the incrementality off, you know, off shelf, like big display activity. Definitely. You need to be shelf stable. And I wanted to build an organization that could go to fight every single day, like that could roll up their sleeves, put on their bare knuckles and just go. And, uh, and that's what we're doing today. And so, um, yeah, that's a lot long answer, but, but there's it's, a lot to unpack. Definitely. Definitely. So I'm curious in the early days and evolving today, what are some of the main marketing strategies that Lemon Perfect use? I know you're an amazing storyteller. Uh, you shared earlier in this episode, uh, what are those marketing strategies that really made it effective for consumers to be convinced towards Lemon Perfect? So I think there are three things, right? Uh, and we're still trying to figure out our story behind the bottle, but here's what I'll say. 
in in beverage for us, you have to have a great product. Yeah. Okay. You have to have strong packaging and you have to have the right pricing architecture. Our best marketing is our trade investment, our retail execution. Okay. So really sophisticated retail programming and best in class retail execution. We get after it in the trenches every day. Okay. Our barrier to entry or trial is really, really low. Right. I was, I was just on the phone with the category manager at Publix who gave us our chance early on in grocery. Yeah. And we run, we run six BOGOs, buy one, get one free at Publix. Okay. Over the course of a year. So, you know, you're, you're, you're talking about over 40 days a year, the customer can walk into, or the consumer can walk into Publix and try us for $1, $1, make, wow. make, make a better for you decision, a better tasting decision versus the competitive category for a dollar. And then we clean that up with three for five for three weeks, right? So you're talking about 18 weeks at three for five. So 18 plus six, it's 24 weeks. It's half the year almost. Where our barrier to trial is really low. And so, and that's a sword that I've fallen on. I've said, like, we're, we're going we're gonna to be a little higher on trade. We're going to probably be a little lighter on brand marketing. Yeah. Because we're selling a beverage. We're still selling what's inside this bottle. People want to look good and they want to feel good. And we yeah. can deliver both with this product. And so, 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 you know, that has been for us. Our best marketing is our field sales investment, is our retail strategy and our field sales investment. That's it. Now, for us to continue to grow our share of stomach story, we now have to go and figure out brand marketing. And that's the next step. We've got the distribution in place, 30,000 doors by the end of this year. We, 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 we can now go and really think about really think about um, uh, how do we build a, a great brand, a cool brand yeah. behind the bottle. Incredible. Uh, congratulations on such mass retail expansion in just a few amount of years. It's truly incredible. And to wrap up this episode, I'd like to conclude with, if you could share one piece of advice with an aspiring entrepreneur, uh, something you've learned or maybe regret along the way, uh, what would that be? Um, I've got a few, Yeah, you know, uh, for anyone, uh, you know, uh, so I'm a single founder. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it helped decision making early on. I'll say that. Uh, and then once you start hiring people, right, like then they become like your co-founders without you having to give up the dilution. Yeah. So, uh, I've chosen to build my team our team late, not early. Okay. So that's been very helpful because now I, I can, you know, I can take in more capital. I can hire more people because we, you know, I, I, I'm still in a great position. Yeah. A above that though, it's hard early and you just have to have great conviction in what you're building. Um, I know it, I know it sounds trite, but just waking up in the morning, doing a somersault out of bed and putting one foot in front of the other throughout the day, and then somehow finding your way back to the bed at night, like that's, that's the game. Yeah. Right. Like that's, that's the game. I, you know, I, again, every business is different. I prioritize share of category or share of stomach for us more than gross margin points early. Right. And so now again, you, you got to be able to raise capital. Yeah. You know, we've raised over $60 million, right? And I've never had help. I mean, I've never hired anyone to help us. I've never given a point away or anything. Um, but I, I just believe that when you're building a business, uh, you can always take price late, but if you can't get people in early, mm. you can't even get to your, you know, you can't get down the road. And so, you know, again, that's always been, that's been a sword that I've fallen on um, is, is, uh, build great team, um, compress on margin early, mm. make sure you have a path to get there. Right. So, 
for us, like now we're in negotiations with our next, the highest level of co-packer. Yep. And uh, I told the crazy story three years ago, but now it's actually going to come true. Like it's going to happen. I, I always said it's going to take $100 million of capital to build a billion dollar business that's spitting out free cash flow. And, and we're going to get there. Billion dollar enterprise business, right? But yeah. call it a $100 million net revenue business. Uh, that's spitting out free cash flow. That that is a valuable, valuable business that will impact the world. Um, and uh, and so, but again, to answer your original question, Cameron, um, I think if you can do this on your own early and add employees that really, in essence, become like your co-founders, mm. uh, and you're giving away a hundred basis points instead of you know, half the company on day one or a third of the, or two thirds of the company on day one. And then if you, you know, once you start, man, just keep going. Just, just, just find a way to live another day. Um, there were multiple nights where I would call my mom crying, um, wanting to get out. Mm. You know, the last thing I'll say, Cameron, is I was in such a dark place early on a couple of times that I almost... I almost took myself out of the CEO chair and hired someone. Mm. I mean, I, I, I actually had an offer letter out. Yeah. And at the absolute midnight hour, I called the, the person I was going to handle hire and say, I, I, I can't do it. I'm going to continue to run the company. So, you know, everyone's got moments like that. If we had made that decision, there's probably lemon perfect pie doesn't exist today. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they just got to You just got to be convicted in what you think you're building uh, or what you can build. Tune out the noise, put your head down, be willing to sacrifice, right? Like be willing to sacrifice because it ain't easy. Yep. But, you know, and then do something. The last thing I'll say, sorry, it's like nine parts of this answer <laughs> is if you're going to build something, it should be something that can become really big. Mm. Don't, don't, don't build anything that, that can't impact a big number of people. Like, yeah believe that you can actually scale a business to, uh, to, to hundreds of millions of people. I mean, cause I think it just, it's more fun for sure. Not that there aren't great businesses that have smaller impact than a niche businesses, but, but Definitely. I'm a big dreamer. Definitely hundred percent. Well, Yanni, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today and to the listeners out there, make sure to check out lemon perfect at lemonperfect.com.